Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to this Dean's Lecture. Uh, and as you know, we, we hold these lectures to celebrate people's appointment or promotion to the rank of professor. It's, it's not easy being, uh, uh, getting on our faculty, but then it's even more of an honor to be promoted to the rank of professor. And so I always say it's, it's not me or the A&P committee that really makes the decision. It's based on, on letters sent from uh, peers around the world that evaluate the candidate's work and, and really pass judgment on them. And so, so it's an affirmation of somebody's career uh, that's not only internal, but external. And so we're here to uh, celebrate Martin uh, Lindquist's promotion to professor. And uh, I just had the opportunity to talk to Martin a little bit. And I reminded him the last time we had the opportunity to talk was when he was interviewing for the job. And, uh, and so I did a before. You did a hard sell there. Yeah, that's <laughs> I did a before and after, and it, it looks like things are going well. Uh, I, I, I warned him that having been to the seminar yesterday, two statistics talks in one day. I don't know if my head's gonna explode here, but, I, but I'm really looking forward to hearing, hearing your talk. So, so I'll tell you about him, although you know more about him than I do. And um, he came to us, uh, he was uh, uh, on the faculty in the School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia. And I remember Karen uh, trying to recruit him and I said to him, why would you, I mean, you're, you're almost tenured, you know, why would you consider coming here? And he said, you know, he really, wanted colleagues to collaborate with and to, to talk with. And, uh, and I assured him he would have that here and that we're a very collaborative place and he, he agrees that that's true. Uh, he uh, got his PhD from, uh, from Rutgers University in statistics and he has an MS in engineering physics with a concentration in applied math from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, he, as many of you know, he's, uh, he works on functional MRI and is actively involved in developing new ways to analyze data to understand brain functioning using neuroimaging. And he has a recent patent with a colleague, uh, Tor Vager. Vager? Okay, uh, sorry. Um, uh, on functional MRI-based neurologic signature of physical pain. So when I read about that, I said, well, what model did he use for physical pain? Was it PhD exams? Uh, what was it? <laughs> Was it master's level? I, I didn't know, but, uh, but congratulations <laughs> on that. So I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, he also was a postdoctoral associate at University of Minnesota Center for Magnetic uh, Resonance Research and a visiting uh, assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics in 2002. He, he came here uh, five years ago about. Uh, to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, and uh, as an associate professor in biostatistics and was recently promoted. So uh, when... He has over 70 articles and has had many awards and serves on many editorial boards. Um, so I asked him earlier today, so was it worth it? Was it worth uprooting your family from, uh, from, uh, from New York? And, and he said that uh, what everybody says to me, he said, this is a wonderful department. So, so we're happy you came and please join me in congratulating and welcoming Mark Lewis. I'd like to start out by thanking Dean Clegg for, for the introduction, also for, for inviting me. It's, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and talking to you about this, um, about my work. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to, to thank the department. It was an amazing choice to come here because the, 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 the Department of uh, Biostatistics here at Johns Hopkins is something else. It's, it's filled of, of really smart people with uh, slightly crazy ideas, which makes it uh, you know, a, a, an amazing place to work. You know? And uh, you know, when, when you come to a biostat uh, dean's lecture, you don't know if you're going to get to talk about opera or, or science or uh, I was half I was half thinking about having a chicken suit on today just to, <laughs> but uh, I, I tried to go a little, little a different type of chicken suit so not, people are not really used to seeing me in and uh, talk more about uh, the science but uh, I, I do want to to highlight uh, you know Karen's great leadership in making the department what it is I also want to, to thank all my colleagues for making it so fun to come to work every day I could mention you all by name but I'll, I'll, I'll mention and, uh, you know the you know the guys in the smart that I work with most uh, Chiprian and Brian and Vadim and and, and John Michelli and and, and, and and all the students that who make this such a great place and, and to, to, all, to all the faculty it's, it's just really a, a, a great pleasure and honor to to be your colleague and work with you um, so 
today I was I was thinking about what what I should talk about today, and I talked. I, I thought, well, I, I went back and forth between lots of different things, but then I decided I'm going to do something really public healthy, uh, 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 and I wanted to do something with with relatively few equations. So I got one equation in here, uh, 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 but 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 and it's very very small. So 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 so, so I, I think we'll be okay. Uh, so if you average my talk and the one yesterday, you'll have a a, a good amount of equations. <laughs> All right, so what am I going to be talking about? I'll be talking about translational neuroimaging. And so t t translational neuroscience lies in sort of the cross-section between sort of basic uh, neuroscience and, and clinical applications. And so when, 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 uh, when functional neuroimaging burst on the scene a couple of decades ago, it generated you know, a whole lot of excitement about you know, what it could do to both revolutionary or revolutionize our, our understanding of the mind, but also be clinically applicable and, and help us and, uh, you know, doctors and MDs uh, to, to make, make decisions and whatnot. And while it's helped us a lot in understanding how the brain works uh, and, and understanding how the mind works, to date it hasn't really made substantial impact in clinical practice. And so what I wanted to do in this talk was, was talk about why. So why hasn't it made the impact that it promised and what can we do about it? So, in this talk, it's going to have four parts here. I'm going to start out by, by, by uh, talking about uh, neuroimaging. So, so you, you don't have to know neuroimaging in advance, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on that. And then I'm going to talk about translational neuroimaging and problems with translational neuroimaging. Finally, I'm going to somewhat pompously talk about translational neuroimaging 2.0, which is what I am proposing as a, another way to, 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 to move forward. And then I'm going to talk about, finally, the second half of the talk is going to be using these, the, these ideas in an application to pain prediction. And, and that's where the, the patent that Dean Clagg mentioned it comes from. So, so the, the, I think that's so, it's, it's some fun work to talk about. So what is, what is neuroimaging? Well, neuroimaging is really sort of an umbrella term for an ever-increasing number of sort of minimally invasive techniques that we can use to study how our brain works. So typically, we talk about uh, structural neuroimaging, which deals with the study of uh, the brain structure and, and you know, diagnosis of disease and injury. And we talk about functional neuroimaging, which deals with the study of cognition and affective processes. So there's different modalities for performing each of these. So structural neuroimaging, you know, you can get sort of a CAT scan or CT scan, as it's called now, or you could get a positron emission tomography scan or a magnetic resonance imaging scan or the like. And all of these, the, these images gives us sort of a snapshot of what's going on in, in the brain in a sort of minimally non-invasive fashion so that we can look inside the brain, you know, without having to sort of open up the skull open. And so this is important because, you know, if, if, we're, if we have an accident or if we, we, we think we might have a stroke or, or something like that or had a concussion, we can bring up person in and, and look at the, at the brain and see if there's any damage or if, there, if, there's, you know, if everything's okay. Now, functional neuroimaging, on the other hand, tries to figure out what we're doing, what we're thinking, how, how we're reacting to, to, to things. And, and, and here, there's also a lot of different modalities. There's EEG and MEG, and there's, the PET can be used for that as well as for structural imaging, and there's functional magnetic resonance imaging. So, so it's, a different, it's used with the same scanner as MRIs, but, but, but it's a functional analog of that. And so what I want to do is I just want to highlight a little bit the differences between these things. So in structural images, we have very high resolution images. So these are very beautiful snapshots uh, of your brain in a moment of time. So they provide no temporal information. So I don't know what's going to happen with this brain in 10 minutes or, 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 or what's going to happen in next year. It's just a, a snapshot in time. But I can very nicely distinguish between different types of tissue, gray matter and white matter and cerebral spinal fluid and the like. And, and I can look for damage and, and, and whatnot. Now, functional imaging, on the other hand, we have a lower spatial resolution because we need lots of these. So what we're doing is we're acquiring lots and lots of, of, of lower spatial resolution images uh, uh, time after time again, maybe every two seconds, so, uh, as in fMRI. So it has a lower spatial resolution, but it has, a, I'm saying higher temporal resolution, but it has a temporal resolution in this case. And so what you can do is you can have people perform tasks while, while you're acquiring these things. So in this case, I'm having a cartoon image where you have two different conditions. And so condition A might be me finger tapping like this. Condition B might be me resting. So, so I finger tap, I rest. I finger tap, I rest. And so basically what I can do is I can look at these images and figure out whether there's changes in signal, which is due to the experimental task. Does the signal go up when I'm finger tapping? And does it go down when I'm resting or, 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 or vice versa? Okay? So those are the type of things that I can do with functional imaging. And so my research is, is, is involves functional uh, imaging, in particular functional magnetic resonance imaging. And so let's talk a little bit about that. 
So fMRI is a completely non-invasive technique for studying brain activity. So there's no known side effects of doing it. It's, it's a little uncomfortable. You have to go into a, a dark pipe, and it's very loud, and it's, 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 not, it's not so maybe so comfortable. But, but Jim Picard does his best to make it comfortable. He, <laughs> um, uh, he, he runs the lab down here at Kirby. Um, and, but, 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 but there's no sort of known, known side effects of this. And so basically, uh, during the course of an fMRI experiment, we acquire a series of brain images while the subject performs a set of tasks. So it could be that finger tapping, resting, finger tapping, resting, or they could be performing some complicated psychological task, or they could just simply be resting. So, so all those things, you could, you could, you know, the sky's the limit. Well, not really. You have to be able to do it inside of a pipe, right? So uh, the sky's not really the limit, but, but, but there's a lot of things that we can do. And what we do is we look for changes in the measured signal between individual images, and we use this to make inferences regarding task-related activations in the brain, okay? So here's what the data structure looks like. So let's say you take a person's uh, brain, and, and you put it in a box you know, figuratively. Uh, and basically, you take that box and you split it up into 100,000 smaller boxes of equal size. So that's the basic unit in, in fMRI data. And those are called voxels. So voxel stands for volume elements. So it's the 3D analog of pixels that you have on your TV. So, so voxels tell us uh, the, the resolution of the image. So these are just these cubic volumes that span the three-dimensional space of the brain. So we just split our brain into 100,000 smaller boxes of equal size. So each of these, these voxels, each of these 100,000 voxels, contain basically two pieces of information. One piece of information is that it has a spatial location. It's in the amygdala, it's in the hippocampus, it's in the visual cortex. So it has some location in your brain. And the second piece of information it has is it has some value representing its intensity. Okay, so in this cartoon image, it's 39. So we'll brush aside what this means, but you have a spatial location and an intensity. We have this at 100,000 different locations. So this is a single brain volume. Now, in fMRI, we acquire hundreds of these. Every two seconds or so, we acquire another brain volume like this. And this cartoon is showing this. And so you can see this as basically a time series of brain volumes that are measured across time. But you can also remember is we can look at an individual voxel. And so that individual voxel had two pieces of information, had a spatial location, and it, and it had an intensity. So if, if, if in each of those volumes I fix the spatial location, I can extract the intensity, and I can get a time series which says that, well, how does the, uh, uh, the signal change in the amygdala or in the motor cortex or, 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 or in your hippocampus as a function of time? And so this is what we usually analyze in fMRI data analysis. We have a time series problem, but it's a time series problem on, on, on sort of on steroids, right? Because we have this one time series from a single voxel, but we have about 100,000 voxels, right? So each area of the brain, each location has a separate time series like this that we have to analyze. Now, they have a complicated correlation structure across time, but also across space. So that makes the things, so, so, so it's, a, it's a big data problem, but it also has a, a complicated correlation structure, which, which makes it a, a difficult problem as well. So big data in itself is not a problem. It's big data that's complicated that's the problem. And, and, and this is definitely the case here. But as you see in this little cartoon, now I can look at these time series and sort of correlate them with the task at hand. So for example, if I'm doing this little t task where I'm finger tapping, resting, finger tapping, resting, uh, I, I, I'm working according to like a box car, as you see here. And so here I might look for voxels where you're going up when you're finger tapping and down when you're resting, up when you're finger tapping and down when you're rest resting. So a signal like this correlates very strongly with the task at hand. So I might deem it to be active or related to the task. It's a little bit more complicated like, than that, but that's the basic uh, gist of it. So what do we want to do? Well, there's a lot of things that we might want to do uh, with this type of data. The dominant approach towards dealing with this is, is what I'm calling the brain mapping approach. So the brain mapping approach is the most common use of fMRI to date, and it's been used to sort of localize area of the brain that activate in, in response to certain tasks. So basically, these types of, of brain mapping studies are necessary for, for the development of biomarkers and also increasing our understanding of how the brain works. 
So this little cartoon picture, I, I always put it in there for a special so sentimental reason, because that's my brain. Uh, and this is from actually from my dissertation as well, so I'll have it until the end of the days. I'll have this in my slides. But um, you might look at this and say, well, Martin, I'm worried about you. You have uh, orange uh, moss growing in your brain. Well, th th those that know me well might, might agree, but th this is not the case. These are actually, these orange things are the results of a statistical test. These are p-values. So I have p-values on my brain. And, and, and so basically what's happening here is that I had a light flashed in my face, and then in reaction to that light flashed in my face, I pressed a button. So this slice goes somewhere like this. So in the back here, it's my visual cortex, and, that, and that's my motor cortex. And basically, you know, being able to relate the task to the signal, this time series, we were able to spot that and perform statistical tests. So now we know that I have a visual and a motor cortex, and so we know where they're located. And so that's basically what a brain mapping a study would do. Uh, you know, usually you would do more complicated things. You might do psychological experiments or, or very complicated things and try to identify different brain regions associated with that. Now, how do we do the brain mapping approach? Well, this is sort of an important thing to, to sort of understand. So this is often done, and, and, and this, this is sort of historical reasons, because this goes back to when you started, when we didn't have that great of computers. It's usually done in what's called a massive univariate approach. Now, what's a massive univariate approach? Well, that means that you treat each voxel in isolation. So you, you take the voxel and you extract the time series from that voxel and you model it, say correlate it to, with the task at hand, and you get a test statistic. And then you do that for every voxel of the brain. So you step through and you do 100,000 different statistical tests. And so we usually use regression models, but you could think of it as being just correlated with the task. So what we do is, at each voxel of the brain, we perform a statistical test, so we get maybe a t-test. We're testing the hypothesis that there's no activation in that brain, because we usually test for, for null events. So the null hypothesis is that there's no activation present in that voxel related to the task. And so we, we do that, and we get a, t, a, a test statistic at each, at each voxel of the brain. So now we're sort of collapsing time, and now what we have is we have an image of t-statistics. It's called a t-map, or a statistical map. Now, if you, if you see this, you'll see that, well, guys that have high t-statistics, those are ones that you should probably reject. So you reject the hypothesis that there's no activation going on there, ergo there is activation, right? And so basically what you want to do in this case is you want to threshold this statistical map at some level and then make a binary decision, yay or nay, this voxel is active. And so that's what people do. So they threshold this at some value. Let's say at, if the t-statistic is above 4, you're, you're active. And, and we color code you accordingly. And, and if you're below 4, we say that you're not active and, and you, you get no color. So that allows us to sort of visualize these things. And we get these beautiful pictures that show you know, where in the brain things are active. Now, the statisticians among you might get a little su suspicious here, because basically what we've done is we've done 100,000 different hypothesis tests. And that's a huge multiple comparison problem. So choosing the appropriate threshold, sort of where to cut off, when is it a, a, a voxel active, yay or nay, is a big problem. And so statisticians have thought about this for a long time. And a lot of the sort of um, discussions in neuroimaging saying that you know, all neuroimaging is false and whatnot are, are actually very fundamentally related to, to, to choosing this threshold in the right way. And so there, there's been a lot of sort of uh, mistakes made and whatnot, but, but, but this is sort of a fundamental th part of the, of the brain mapping approach. Does that make sense? All right, so we're on, we're on board there. So this is going to sort of lead me in into, to, to now, so that's my background on, on neuroimaging, so now we're all experts here. Now let's talk about tra translational neuroimaging. So we want to sort of move this into, into the, in the clinical setting so they can help people. Uh, um, and so most early translational neuroimaging efforts were, were based on this brain mapping approach. So, so the brain mapping approach sort of drove a lot of these. And that sort of makes sense if you think about a history, because it was based a little bit on, on lesion studies and sort of theories of modularity and things like that. You know, typically a lot of what we knew about the brain before neuroimaging involved you know, that you got a brain lesion, and so that there's a certain part of your brain that stopped working, and so your behavior changed, right? And so then the idea is that we, well, if we could pinpoint those regions and look for correlates between this behavior and that brain location. So that was sort of the idea, and it was like, okay, we can do this using this brain mapping approach. And so the goal was here to understand what functions and processes were, were encoded in very isolated target uh, uh, brain regions of interest. Okay? 
Now, these studies sort of helped identify lots of different brain features, and these brain features are, are sort of measures of activity in very specific brain regions. And they, they found these brain features that were predictive of health-related outcomes, maybe depression or, 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 or whatnot, or, 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 or different behavior and things like that. But once people identified these different regions and tried to take it to the next level, to like a, a clinical trial level, so that we can make it translational, they almost always failed. Okay? So, so it, it just didn't work. So these, these clinical trials that targeted these specific brain regions, you, you found that sort of the, the ACC was related to, to depression, and you targeted this using sort of deep brain stimulation or neurofeedback and things like that, and it, it just didn't hold up in, in, in a more rigorous study. And, and so why, why is this the case? Well, it's funda one fundamental reason why this is the case is the analysis is completely wrong. And, and so, so the analysis and the brain mapping approach, as, I, as I've described it, was never really designed with translational goals in mind. That, that, was, never the, that was never the point of it. And, and the main goal of brain mapping is to test null hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that there's no structure function relationship. Uh, 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 and uh, if we have enough evidence to reject it, we reject it, right? That's all it's really designed, designed to do. And it has one big shortcoming, and this is sort of one of the big fallacies in, in modern neuroscience, and this is this problem of reverse inference. So basically, the brain mapping approach is designed for inferences that a brain region B is active, conditional on some type of stimulus S. So it's giving us information about the probability of B given S. So we, I, 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 I know I gave you a stimulus uh, that, 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 uh, that disgusts, uh, uh, something that's disgusting, and it, and it activates your amygdala, right? Th that I know. But I can't make the, the, the opposite thing saying that just because your amygdala activates, you're feeling disgusted, right? That would be the opposite. That would be the probability of, of a stimulus given activation. So that's called reverse inference. And, and Many other of the scandals in neuroimaging has been due to this subtlety. So there's sort of a classic case in the, in the New York Times. I brought up the amygdala because it was this New York Times editorial. It was before the 2008 election. So the, 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 basically they said, well, you know, we're showing people pictures of the different candidates and we're measuring their brain activation. And there was a certain candidate uh, for whom a lot of people's amygdala lit up. And they said, well, the, uh, when, you, when you show people disgusting things, the amygdala lights up. So obviously, they're feeling disgust. But the amygdala does lots of things. It could be positive emotions as, as well. But they were doing this sort of classical reverse inference problem. And, and, and that's, that's something that, 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 that that's a, that's a you know, it's, it's a big deal. And, 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 and so in, in translational uh, issues, we often want to be able to predict a stimulus or, or a syndrome rather than the opposite way around. So this is sort of the wrong way to think about the problem. Okay, make sense? All right, and then finally, another thing that's tr tr more and more proven to be true is that this brain mapping thing has been sort of focused on isolated brain regions. Is the amygdala re related to, to the depression? Well, maybe it is, but there's also a lot of other regions that are simultaneously related to that. So many features of different disorders are likely sort of encoded in, in distributed systems evolving networks of many different brain regions. And so just looking at one brain region might not be sufficient in order to get a, a holistic picture of what's going on. So those are the, the sort of the shortcomings with the brain mapping approach. So a while back, people said, well, we have to do something different. This, this brain mapping approach might not really work out. So to overcome these shortcomings, researchers began to sort of investigate alternative analysis strategies. Uh, one such I is this so-called predictive mapping, or sometimes it's called multivoxel pattern analysis, or MVPA. And these have shown a, a great deal of promise in, in trying to do it. So it kind of reverses the, 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 the problem a little bit. So in predictive modeling, what we try to do is we try to find a pattern. We use pattern recognition techniques to de develop sort of an integrated model of activity across the brain, across the entire, we call these brain signatures. So these are signatures across the entire brain that allows us to predict clinical outcomes. So here's the, 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 well, the first equation. It's not an equation that you might, might look like, but it's basically we want to take a function of a person's brain activation and predict their outcome. So the outcome is some function of this brain activation. Let's think of the, the simplest function that we can do. It's a linear function. So basically, let's let x be the brain activation in every box of the brain strung out, and w is some weight. So basically, this is 
This is just a, a, a weighted average over the activity all over the brain. Okay? So this is interesting because now the W is basically a weight that corresponds to every brain location. We can map that back onto the brain and we can look at the equation like this. So it's the brain signature, which I'm calling it, it times the brain activation, which gives us the signature response. So the brain signature is basically telling us the weights of the brain activation that will give us that number. So if it's yellow, that means that we weigh it high. If it's, if it's purple, I don't know if you can see that, it means that we weigh it low and things like that. So basically, the, the, the key thing I want to say here is that by doing these predictive things, trying to predict this, we can actually get these brain signatures which look distributed over the entire brain and tries to map it onto the outcome. Okay? So our key thing here is trying to find these different brain signatures because hopefully they'll tell us something about what's going on in the brain and also help us predict this, this, this outcome of interest. The outcome can be whether you have this disease or not, whether you're in pain or not, or, 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 or whatever. It can either be binary or, 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 or it can be continuous. You just have to make things, little, slight little changes in each case. Now, what's the benefit of doing it this way? Well, again, the direction of inference is reversed relative to sort of conditional brain mapping. So now the brain features are the predictors and you map it onto the outcome. So you're doing it the, the other way around than we did in, in the brain mapping studies. Uh, also, it integrates all available brain data from the entire brain into, so, in, into one single measurement, into so, one single sort of best guess of what's going on in your brain. And then finally, uh, uh, it, you know, we can test this thing uh, and evaluate its performance in new out-of-sample individuals. And we can, uh, we can use this sort of brain signature as sort of a product that we, that, that, that we test on different uh, populations and whatnot to see how it works. And, I, and I'll illustrate that in the, in the example at the end. Now, we're not the first people to use predictive modeling. So we, we did a, a survey of the field. And there's about 500 studies that have done this. This is very interesting. So about 42% of them were on Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, there's psychosis, schizophrenia, you know, autism, ADHD, Parkinson's. The interesting thing about this is these correspond very, very, very closely to the, the freely available big data sets. So, so, for example, there's a big data set on AD, it's the ADNI, and the, there's the ADHD uh, 200, there's, there's a Parkinson's database, which is slipping my mind now what the, what the, name, the acronym is. But basically what, what's driving these applications are often that the data is available to researchers, quantitative researchers, uh, that, that, can, that can read in this data and apply it and do these analysis. So this is you know, sort of one of the big things that's going to help us in the end of the day is making data available, making it free to, 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 to for people to do, and, and you can see very, very nicely how, how this is driving, uh, driving the research problems in a, in, a, in a good way. Now, if we look at this, um, you know, when we look at the classification performances, it looks fantastic. You, you look at all these different uh, um, uh, diseases and you see, well, they're all above chance and, and some of them are close to 100% accuracy. That seems a little... Uh, Unlikely, because even the doctors aren't 100%, uh, you know, the, the reliability between doctors on diagnosing it isn't, isn't even that high. So either we're really catching lightning or a bottle, or, or, or there's some uh, over-optimism or something like that. And that's the case. And that's one of the problems with these predictive modeling approaches is that they're very easy to overfit. It's easy to sort of cheat. You know, not even in a nefarious way, but if the way that you pre-process the, the, the data somehow relates to how you're, you're fitting it and, and whatnot, it, you can often get too friendly results. So the key thing here is that we actually have to look at the performance of these signatures in independent data. Now, how often do people do that? Well, this is the big problem. Only in 9% of the time do people apply these methods to perspective uh, testing, to independent data sets. And as you'll see, in these cases, um, you know, the, the prediction accuracy is still pretty good, but, but it's lower than, than it would be otherwise. And this is a, a major shortcoming. So now we've gone from 500 studies down to 45 studies. And so even if you're doing this predictive modeling where you're sort of you're getting the, the reverse inference in the correct way, you're still not going far enough. This is never going to be translational unless you test it again and again and again on independent data sets and figure out the way to different populations and, and the like. So just because it works on your one data set that you trained on, big whoop. OK? 
Okay? So these studies sort of show that there's hope for using neuroimaging to understand brain disorders because they seem to be giving good results. However, it's, it, 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 there's, it's also indicating that things must mature significantly for it to realize its potential. We really need to be able to figure out a, a testing system that, that, that allows us to sort of, in, in a very coherent way, test whether or not th th these things work in independent data sets. So again, what we're pr proposing is that we develop these brain signatures and have them developed and validated within sort of systematic biomarker development framework. So that's sort of what we need, that's what I'm talking about with them. Um, neuroimaging or translational neuroimaging 2.0 is the way that we evaluate these, these, these signatures. So these should be models that are sort of shareable research products. So I should have a signature and we should send it out to different people, different labs that, that, that should apply it uh, to independent data sets. And we should, you should get the results back and, and, and that will allow us to figure out what the kinks are and, and, and move the field forward. So what are things that need to be need to happen for, this to, to, for, for, for us to be able to, to move forward in, in this translational neuroimaging? Well, there's a couple of things that have to be true. For, for example, these, these signatures that we developed, uh, they have to have a diagnostic value. They have to be predictive of an outcome at the individual level. If it doesn't, if I, if I, can't, if I don't train a, a, a thing that diagnoses a disease and I, can't, I bring in a new person and it doesn't work on them very well, you know, never works on them, but rather than chance, it's no point, right? So it has to have a diagnostic utility. And there's also important to consider both sensitivity and specificity in this case. And so what do I mean like this? Well, I'm going to be talking about pain later. So pain activates certain brain areas. But there are other things that activate the same brain areas, being rejected. Uh, you know, for example, if my colleagues go for coffee in the morning and don't uh, invite me, you know, to, um, I'll feel rejected. And that might activate the same brain regions as pain does. When I hear that the dean is stepping down, activates the same pain regions. You know, there's a lot of things like that that could be confused. So I don't want the news of the dean to impact my diagnostic cl cl clinical study, right? So, so, so I, I, I can't have that sort of confounding. And so that's an important thing that, that, that we consider in, in, in the diagnostic value. The other thing is neuroscientific validity. How plausible is a model and how does it contribute to understanding you know, how, how the mind works? In this case, there's a question of interpretability versus prediction accuracy. So I'm reminded of one of the early works here. There was a competition uh, that, that was trying to predict different things and, and, and the winning model basically just used, used brain signature that, that took information from the ventricles. The ventricles, they have nothing to do with the brain activation, but for some reason it was predictive of, of, of this thing and it won. It had the highest prediction accuracy. Did we learn anything about the brain? No. Okay, so in that case, it's probably not such a great thing. Another thing, I mean, let's just do a cartoon example. You could have, say, a, a diagnostic things for Parkinson or something, and maybe Parkinson pa patients tend to move more than, uh, than, than, than others. And so if you might have a, a signature that's more sensitive to movement. And, and again, that's not going to be very robust because when you get better equipment that, that's able to sort of correct for motion in a better way, then that's going to disappear. Right? Because it's based on an artifact. And, and if you can get rid of the artifact, and again, you're not learning anything about how the brain's working. So, so that's, that's an important thing. Another thing is that the, the model must be sort of easily applicable to new individuals and shareable. So that's why is, is, is sort of in this whole data sharing type thing and reproducible science. I should be able to give you my signature and we should be able to, 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 to run it on new data sets and figure out when it works and when it doesn't work. It's easy to do in, in, in today's thing, today's research environment. Uh, and so this can allow us to test for generalizability across contexts and, and populations and whatnot. And I'll illustrate this in the example all moving forward. So, so our, our approach towards doing this uh, is, 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 so we have this sort of approach towards developing these brain signatures that can be shared, tested in multiple contexts, and used in, in applied settings. And so it's based on using these multivariate techniques. We're pretty agnostic about which multivariate technique you use, but basically that you use a holistic picture of the brain uh, that allows you to sort of diagnose clinical outcomes or, or, re or relevant mental processes. Then we have to perform assessment and optimization of, uh, of this for its diagnostic value. And that's where most people stop. That's where you know, 450 of these studies stopped. What we need to do is we need to go to the third step. We need to then perform sort of a program of broad exploration and, and, and figure out how generalizable this is across samples and research contexts and, and populations and the like. 
And so here's a little cartoon uh, showing this, uh, where, where most people stop, you know, 450 of these things stop after just doing cross-validation on the available data and, and, and calling it a day. You know, 45 of these look at uh, independent data, and that's great. But then after that, you have to keep doing, looking whether it replicates across different scanners, different sites, uh, different laboratories that do things different ways, and also finally across different diverse population, racial groups, gender, you know, uh, whatnot. Okay? And so all those are sort of steps, and, and, and it's only the sort of the most promising models that are sort of carried forward. So you know, maybe uh, it's okay to have 500 of these, and maybe they don't generalize, but that's okay. You know? Some of them, will, the cream will rise to the top, and those will move forward as we move along. Okay? So does that make sense? Okay, so in this case, these are big words. But now we want to sort of put this to use. And so one place where we've had success in doing this is in, in, in developing a brain signature for pain. So pain is, of course, a, a very important health problem. A lot of people suffer from pain, and it's very debilitating. And there's actually only one way to measure pain, and that's to ask somebody how much pain you're feeling on a scale from 0 to 10 or something like that. Or when you bring your kids into the pediatrician, you know, the, 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 you know you, they have smiley face to frowny face, and they get the point. And, and, and you know, it's all self-report. So again, this is influenced by a lot of things about your emotion, cognitive biases, social decision making, and the like. So what we were interested in doing was sort of defining a robust and sort of meaningful signature that allowed us to predict physical pain. How much pain is a person feeling? Okay, so that's, that's the goal that, that we wanted to do. And so this is joint work with, with Tor Weger, who used to be my colleague at Columbia, but we, we went separate ways. He, he, he's now at Colorado, and I'm, I'm here at Johns Hopkins. And, 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 but we've, you know, we've written maybe 30 or 35 papers together and collaborated for the last 13, 14 years. So he, he's a very close collaborator uh, on this, so I just need to show his picture. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to develop this brain uh, signature for pain. So we had data from four subjects of 114 people. And so we developed this fMRI measure that predicts pain intensity at the level of the individual subject. But that's, 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 only, that's well and good. So what we did is we, we used these four studies to start doing what, what I was suggesting to do, to, to, to start the process of sort of validation and looking for sensitivity and specificity. So study one was used to identify the brain structure associated with heat-induced pain. So that gave us the, 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 the brain signature or the biomarker. Uh, study two was our independent data set. It's, it studied how sensitive this biomarker was or uh, to the signature was to, 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 to pain versus warmth in a new sample. So this is our independent data set that's moving things forward a step. Then we assessed its specificity relative to social pain, which, as I mentioned before, activates much of the same brain region. So when I get excluded from the coffee train, that activates exactly the same brain regions as if somebody burns me. Yeah, it does, Cyprian. <laughs> <laughs> I've been meaning to say that. <laughs> He's very good at inviting me. Uh, uh, finally, study four. It's your show. It's your show. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I can mock you. <laughs> no. and, and study four assesses the responsiveness of the measure to, to some uh, remifentanil, which is an opioid that, 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 that sort of should decrease pain. And so we wanted to see what, what that did. So this was a start. But only a start, but, 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 but we'll, we'll get to what's going on after that. So this is the first study. We had 20 subjects. They received painful stimuli at, at four different intention, uh, intensities. So they had a little burner on their arm. And, and it was between maybe 44 and 49 degrees uh, Celsius. So 44 is warm, uh, but, but doesn't hurt. 49 hurts. It's, uh, and, and so basically, we wanted to look at the contrast between warm and hot, because you wanted to get rid of how the stimulus was, was, was given to you and just pinpoint the difference between getting that stimulus when it's not painful and, and when it's painful. Okay? And so, again, each trial consisted of separate periods of anticipation, uh, thermal pain, and pain recall. And recall that things like pain recall and, and anticipation, they're also easily confused with pain. So that's giving us a little bit of a test case, because if you're thinking about pain, that's also activating the same brain regions. 
It's, it's complicated. So the outcome, oops, and so the outcome measure was, was a pain report. So basically, you burn them, you measured the brain, and, 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 and you ask them how much it hurt. Okay? Bastards. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> and so our, our goal was to develop these, these brain signatures. We wanted to get these weights. So we wanted to take a person's brain activation while they're, while, while they're getting this painful stimulus, find a brain signature like that where we could take the weight and, and predict their pain score, 3.21 on a scale from 0 to 10. Not very bad. If the brain activation changes, the, pain, the, the signature response might be 8 or 9. That means it really hurts. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, this, these are the technical details, and uh, I'm seeing that time is going quicker. But basically, you know, there's lots of different ways to do this. There's lots of different algorithms that you could use. We found that it didn't really matter all that much. What really mattered was sort of how you did your feature selection and, and, and how you set up the problem and whatnot, and whether you use model A or model B to, to, to estimate this this, this, this. this was sort of less important. But with, instead of just looking at these details, we were then doing these methods. We had this thing called lasso PCR, which is principal component regression with a, with a L1 penalty for, for the nerds in the crowd. Uh, which is everyone, I guess. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we got this thing, which is called the, the neurologic pain signature. We didn't give it this name. Uh, it was given to us by the reviewers uh, after six rounds of review. It was the most painful review process in my life. But if they're asking for it to be called the neurologic pain signature, then it's called the neurologic pain signature. Um, and so basically, this uh, it would like to sort of highlight is just basically these are weights. So if you have a lot of activation in, say, the ACC, that means that you're going to report more pain. These are negative weights. So if you have a lot of activation in the precuneus, that's going to suppress pain report. So it has a clear interpretation. It's not just the ventricles, right? So, so, so these are all regions that, 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 are, that are sort of associated with pain. Now, I've thresholded this slightly to make it easier to look at. So we did some bootstrap thresholding. But, but these, are, these are basically the key, the key regions that, that, that are involved. So this is now a brain signature, something that we can put into practice. And we can apply to new data sets, because uh, now we're sort of agnostic to how the data was acquired. You just give me brain activation, and I can apply this, and I can figure out how much pain you're feeling. right? Because that's the only input to this model, brain activation. So it doesn't have to be from a pain experiment, either. I could put anything in there and, and, and get a pain score. And so we would ideally want, if you put in something where you were doing something happy that you wouldn't report a, 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 a high pain. But, but we're able to do that. And so now we want to start testing this. But before I do it, I just want to show you these results. So this was still when we're doing it within the sample. So this is cross-validated prediction of pain. So we're doing sort of uh, the, the pain report versus the predicted pain report in sort of uh, 20 cross-validated samples here. And, and, uh, and uh, the correlation is very strong. It's about 0.75, which is, which is great. But again, it's on, you know, still not on independent data. Uh, this is a really interesting one, because as we move from the different stimulus levels, You'll see in red here that the, the, the pain response from, from the biomarker uh, went up, as it should. So the, more, the higher the temperature, the more pain they were feeling. However, if, if we took activity under the anticipation or the pain recall, which again activates the same regions of the brain, you'll see that it flatlines. So it doesn't change, even if you're giving high temperature or, or, or low temperature, it's, it's agnostic to that. So it's flatlining. So it seems to be that this signature is sensitive to, to physical pain, but it's not impacted by, by, by either anticipation of pain or recall of pain, which is important because, again, they're activating similar brain regions. Now, the next study is an independent thing. So we had 30 subjects, and they received a series of 75 stimulations across six different temperatures. Here, they were asked two questions. So the first question was, is it painful, yes or no? And they made that determination. And then they, afterwards, they, they, they rated it on, on a 100-point scale. So if they said it was not painful, they, they, zero was no sensation at all. And 100 was very warm, but not yet painful. And if they did say it was painful, it was rated on again on a 100-point scale, where zero was no pain, and 100 was worst imaginable. So now we have a, a scale from zero to 200, if we compare these, where and in the middle, there's a change point where it's not painful, and then it becomes painful increasingly. Okay. 
Here's, here's some results. Here's showing how the, the signature response increases as the temperature increases. So again, as we step up from 44.3 degrees Celsius to 49.3 degrees Celsius, uh, the, 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 the amount of pain that the signature is saying that you're reporting increases in sort of this exponential fashion. These pr percentages are saying how often can we separate the one degree increment from each other, and it gets better and better as you get higher up. Well, this is actually the best separation. Um, here's an interesting picture. So this is how the, the, the biomarker response uh, uh, is uh, by reported intensity. And this is very interesting because it kind of looks like a hockey stick. So basically, what happens is if it's not painful, it's going up slightly, but, but not by so much. But once they see that it's, it, it's painful, bang, it goes up very, very, very strong. So it's, being very, it's not so, so necessarily so sensitive to non-painful heat, but when it becomes painful, there's, there's quite a change there in, in how, how, how the signature responds. So this is, again, you know, very, very, very promising. Now the third, if you think that people have been mean so far, Wait to study number three. So study number three, this was done at Columbia, and a, a graduate student went on Craigslist and say, recently been dumped, come to our study. And so the, the, he, he, at the end of the day, he got 80 people, but we only have 40 here. So these are 40 people that were, 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 were found on Craigslist who had recently been rejected in a romantic relationship. So they'd been dumped. So they were asked to bring in a, a picture of their significant former significant other, as well as, as, as a, you know, a friend, a solid rock that you can always trust to and talk to. So, so, so and then what they did is they gave them four different con con conditions. They, they viewed a picture of the rejector. They viewed a, a picture of their friend. They got high pain and they got low pain, right? I tell you. And so after this, uh, you know, the participants reported their perceived pain after each trial. So the major finding of this study, and this sort of fit in the literature, was that, again, Social rejection-related pain activates all the same canonical sort of pain processing regions as physical pain. I think CNN picked up on this, love hurts, right? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, beautiful, the headlines write themselves. And, and this sort of fits into, a, there's a long literature about how social pain sort of piggybacks on sort of the networks of, of physical pain. So this seemed like a delightful study to test our biomarker uh, on because we would want it to be sensitive to physical pain, but not whether or not your girlfriend or boyfriend was mean to you that day. Okay? So here's some interesting results. So can the signature differentiate between physical and social pain? So we applied the signature from study one to, to study three, and then we found that, you know, it, can, you, can it separate a, a hot stimulus versus a warm? So you got one of those, and so the one that, that reported the most signature response, that was deemed the, the hot, and the other one was warm. So it's sort of a forced choice. So, oops, it was successful in about 93% of the time. So, so it was very good at doing that. Now, was it able to separate when you were, your brain when you were looking at your rejector versus your, 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 your friend? No, it was a chance for that. So that was very encouraging. And so if we looked at, uh, at the signature response, you see it, 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 it activates a lot. You get high values when you have high pain. You have lower values when you have low pain. But when you're seeing a picture of, of, of your rejector or your friend, it's not really reacting. So that's really good, because that, that's the question of the sensitivity and specificity. We, won't, we don't want the signature to be confused by other things that are similar, that, that are working in the same brain regions. Now, this is an interesting follow-up study. So now we use the bigger sample from this, and, and we derived specific. So you can say, well, hey, you know what? Your, your signature was, was, was derived on, 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 on physical pain derived on your arm. The other thing is pain through your eyes, right? You're looking at a photo. So th they're two different things. So, 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 so that's what's picking up. That's why the difference is. And that, that would be a very good peer reviewer who says that. So, so that's a very reasonable thing to do. So what we can do is we can look at those regions and train separate classifiers, one that, that, that predicts whether or not it's uh, physical pain and the other which predicts social pain. So we can have two different signatures here, one for physical pain and one for social pain. So we did that and we derived uh, 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 signatures for each of those within regions that were activated both by physical and social pain. So here's one particular area there in the anterior cingulate, and this is the pain, this is the pattern, the weights associated with physical pain. Now, can we predict warm versus hot? Well, I'm doing this. 
We can do it about 85% of the time. And again, can I predict ex-partner versus friend? That's only 50% of the time, so that's chance. That's like a coin flip, right? So we're doing significantly better for this when, 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 we're, when, when, we're, um, when we're doing what it's designed to do. Now, what if we train a similar classifier on the same region, but that, that tries to separate between rejector versus friend? Well, in this case, you get another pattern like that. It's not the same pattern anymore. But this guy, he's really good at predicting or not whether you're seeing your ex-partner and friend. So it's 71% accuracy, but he's at chance for the other one. So this is sort of a, a double dissociation, right? So th th this allows us to sort of, um, one pattern in the same brain region allows us to predict physical pain, but doesn't work on social pain. And another pattern does the opposite. These patterns, if you look at them, are quite different. The correlation between them is, is pretty much zero. So even though, and, and you can go through other regions and find similar results, so even though the same brain regions are working when I'm seeing my rejector as when I'm being burned, they're working differently. Okay, And this is showing that. And so to really show that, we went into an independent data set consisting of, again, this is data is freely available now. And one data set that's really freely available is, is resting state data. So we took a person's resting state data sets from 91 subjects, and we basically extracted data from the ACC, and we weighted them according to each of these patterns. So one we weighted according to, to, the, to, the, to the physical pain pattern, and the other we weighted according uh, to, 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 to the pain rejection. So we got one time series uh, corresponding to pain, uh, physical pain, and the other two, rejection pain. And then we did a seed analysis, and we looked for correlations with these time series across the entire brain. And lo and behold, what happens is that they're related to different brain regions. So it's the same brain region, but they're extracted in different ways, weighting different parts of the brain region in different manners. And so they have very little overlap. So even though it's the same brain regions are involved in both physical and social pain, they're being used in quite different ways and communicating with other brain regions in a nice way like this. So I'm running out of time. So one of the things I just wanted to show is how this works with them. With drugs, so in the, in the fourth one, we, we did a sort of uh, uh, gave these people remifentanil, which is sort of an opioid, and, and uh, there's, there's some details here. But the key thing here I want to show you is, is this slide. So this is sort of the, the PK model for for the for the opioid. So this is how it's working, and then when, when it wears off here, and if you look at at, 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 the, at the, uh, the pain scores for high pain, you'll see that they're an inverted version of the PK model. So, you know, as the opioid enters your system, uh, your, the, the reported pain by this biomarker, by this mathematical model, is growing down similarly. And so when the PK model changes and starts wearing off, the pain starts increasing again. So it, 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 it's... It's very much picking up on, on the utility of, of, of these op opioids as well. So here are some sort of characteristics of this. And so this MPS thing has, has a 90 to 100 percent sensitivity and specificity to pain in individuals. It doesn't respond to other affective events so, so much. Uh, it shows uh, tracks pain more closely than temperature, so it's more useful than look, knowing the temperature. It shows. Uh, analgesic <laughs> treatment responses, and it also transfers across body sites and different types of, of acute pain. And so now we're running this in, 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 on lots of different labs, and it shows that it's sensitive across many different data sets from different sites and sex and, 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 and racial groups and the like. So this becomes, now that we have this biomarker, it's basically one data file. And so we can take this data file and we can send it to all our collaborators across the world. So here, there's, there's 30 different sites that have applied this. And then we can look at the results. And all, all these sites are, have different magnets. They have different ways of scanning. They have you know, idiosyncratic differences. And they have different populations. And so we can then look at these things and see how generalizable it is. And so this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this uh, translational neuroimaging 2.0, is we have to be able to do this and look at these different populations. And the results are, are, are quite, quite um, encouraging. So it turns out that the MPS is activated by distension, you know, un 
pleasant pressure, shock, and heat, which are sort of visceral, you know, like, like physical pain type things. But it's not activated by things like looking at aversive images uh, and anticipating pain or feeling social rejection or, or the like. So it seems to be doing what it's supposed to do and picking up on things that it is. But it's still a work in progress. And, and, but, 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 but I think that go, you know, those 500 studies that, doing, that are doing sort of the machine learning type things on the data, they're going so, so, on such a little step. And that's what's, the, there's a huge step going from that into the, the clinic. And, you have to go through, I think, all these hoops in order to get that. And so that's sort of what I wanted to, 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 to share with you today. So despite its, its great promise, uh, you know, functional neuroimaging has yet to, to impact clinical practice and public health. Uh, we hope that's going to change. Uh, 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 and so we discussed here an approach for developing brain signatures that can so, sort of be used and shared. And the hope is that sort of the pro proposed approach or some derivative of it uh, will offer some opportunity to sort of close the gap between basic neuroscience uh, and sort of translational uh, neuroscience. And so I want to, to just highlight uh, 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 some, some of the collaborators. I have a lot of collaborators that both here at Hopkins, at Columbia, and at the University of Colorado. So a lot of this work was, again, with Tor Wager, and there were some graduate students, Luke Chang and, and Wani Wu, and a former uh, uh, grad student, Lauren Atlas of Tors, who, 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 who were, were main collaborators in this, in this pain research. So I, I want to, to sort of highlight them, but, uh, but I also want to highlight people around here. Um, and, and, and the funders as well. So all, all this stuff is from, from these four papers, and uh, I'm happy to share if, if you're interested. And then finally, I want to thank you for your attention, and it wouldn't be a biostat talk if I didn't shamelessly promote my MOOC. All right, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was a great talk. And uh, really interesting stuff. So, so I can think of lots of ways you might use this, right? So you could use this to figure out when people who can't communicate about yes, pain, right? That would be that, that, one, that, that was one of the yeah. And then you you could use it to figure out, you know, we we don't really know how pain works, right? We have all these theories about the gate theory and all that, but you could. What does this tell you about how the brain works in terms of of uh, sensing pain and, and processing pain? Well, well uh, that's an excellent thing. I mean, one one thing that we've sort of been Try not to say we, we don't want this to sort of uh, take the place of, of, of people's self-reports because people's self-reports are, are, are valuable. But there are some sort of at-risk populations, like if you're in a coma or if you're too young or you can't speak, that that, that this could, could 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 be useful. But I think your point is absolutely correct. Is what, what I think one of the main utilities, and this is where we're going from sort of um, uh, prediction accuracy to, to, to interpretability, is, is it's telling us a little bit about the different brain regions and how they communicate with, with each other and the things. And, and that's why I, I was sort of, uh, I wanted to highlight this sort of last study when we're saying that even the brain regions, the way that they're being used and the way that they're sort of communicating with the rest of, of, of the brain uh, is different uh, during these different things. So I think this can teach us a lot about, about that process. Uh, and, and, you know, you can imagine doing things like uh, maybe um, TMS or something like that that, 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 that that knocks out certain regions and you can see how that affects sort of p uh, how pain is felt and also how it's... How it's uh, uh, what is that? I, I don't know. It's a vacuum. Oh, it's a vacuum. Well, you know. Vacuum. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the, the other, you know, a big problem when you work in emergency rooms are people with sickle cell disease or other people who are chronically using narcotics. And so people with sickle cell disease, there's no objective way to know. You know if they're sickling, you can see on the smear. But other than that, they can have, you know, painful crises, and you, you, you can't tell. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a real conundrum where it puts patients and doctors on, op, you know, where you're trying to withhold drugs, they're trying to get to sure. This, if you could, if you could do, you can't do this in the ER setting now, but it would be a way that would be an objective measure, if you will, yeah, yeah. of pain, right? I mean, I, I think that's, that, that, that's, that's the goal. I mean, and that's, you know, the translational part of it is, is, is that you, you want to you wanna give it to, to the doctors. You want the doctors to have have this utility. Of course, you know, there's a lot of sort of headaches and the fact that, you know, you have to put a person in the scanner and it's not like a bedside thing. Uh, but, 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 uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the hope is that it, that it, that it could be. But, but, but I think even before you get to that level, you have to be pretty sure that it works. And, and, and so I think the point I, I, I want to make is that you have to be very rigorous about it. And it's just not that 
your, your, your model fits the data that you trained it on. Mm -hmm. It's that it, that, it, that it works in crazy settings or unusual settings, and, 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 and it's not confused and stuff like that. And so, so I, I, I think that's just a necessary step. And then you know, hopefully you can make it into a, a, a clinical setting. But, but you know, again, there's a ways to go, but, 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 but at least there's some hope. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So. So, uh, so I know it's a little late, but we have time for one question, or we can uh, do it out uh, with the vacuum uh, machine. <laughs> but I can clear. Or I can come vacuum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if not, so why don't we, why don't we yeah, yeah. up by the wall of wonder? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.